Hey, Renter Retires, it's Adam Schrader here for another episode, and I'm joined by the man, the myth, the legend, Zach Lemaster, the CEO and founder of Rent to Retirement. And today we are joined by Kevin Bupp. He is a Florida-based real estate investor, and he is also the principal and founder of Sunrise Capital Investors. He focuses a lot on the commercial real estate side of things, and so we wanted to bring him on to talk about that sector and how that's doing in today's world. He's also done a whole lot in mobile home parks. So that's another, that's a you know method of investing. We haven't touched on a whole lot here in, uh, on the podcast. So we wanted to bring him in to talk about these sectors. So Kevin, welcome to the show. Adam and Zach, thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Absolutely. So you've been in the game a, a long time. You've written several books as if you're watching this on uh, our YouTube channel, you can see the quantity of mass quantity of books behind him. But uh, tell us a little bit about kind of how you got started. Did you start in single family or did you start or, or, you know, completely into commercial or how did you get started in your journey and what are you doing today? Yeah, great, great question. And, I'll, and a little bit of clarity there. I've only written one book, but I'm pretty proud of it. It took me like three years to actually get it. And it just launched about a, about a month ago. So, but one, I, don't, I think I'm one and done with the book thing, but we'll see. <laughs> it's, that's, it's, what all, that's what they yeah, all say. Yeah, I guess, I guess. So, yeah, no, as far as I, how I got started, like, like a lot of folks do, um, I did get started in single family. It just happened to be that my, my mentor, who I met back when I was 19 years old, um, that's what his business was. Uh, you know, he, he, I lived in a small town, Pennsylvania and, um, ultimately I met him and, and, you know, he owned a number of single family and small multifamily, you know, like duplexes and triplexes, uh, you know, rentals in, in our small town in Pennsylvania. And so, um, just not looking to reinvent the wheel and just really trying to comprehend the business as a whole. And, and again, just really trying to replicate his model because it seemed to work for him. Um, that model happened to be based on mostly single family properties. And so um, I ran that kind of business uh, uh, for many, many years under, you know, just again, not necessarily under his guidance, but just really following his principles that he taught me. And, and it really, I didn't have a lot of money when I got started. I was a, I was tending bar and I was in, in college at the time. And so, it was uh, it was more of a buy the first property with I had seven thousand dollars in cash and I had a private lender who David my mentor uh, introduced me to um, used all that seven thousand dollars that was all the money in the world to me and uh, bought that first property and I realized very quickly um, that David's model of just you know uh, you know hold for cash flow like literally everything he bought he held for um, you know monthly recurring cash flow that you know, for me to make it to that second property, it would have taken a very long time, you know, for me to actually pull capital back out of that property or save up enough from the cash flow in order to put another down payment on another property. So very quickly, I learned that I really had to go more into a, you know, wholesale two, keep one or wholesale three, keep one, whatever that ratio it wasn't always the same, but ultimately I would, I would flip as many as necessary in order to have enough capital to um, to buy another property. And then, you know, over time I started building equity, each one of those properties I could refinance and take the capital out and things like that. But um, it took a couple of years really to get the wheels rolling, but long story short, um, built up a, quitty, a pretty big portfolio of single family properties on my early twenties um, over a hundred, about 122 to be exact. Um, and then a couple hundred small multifamily properties. And, uh, that led me to the crash of 08. It was very challenging. That was down here in Florida. I moved down here in my in my early 20s. Uh, shortly after getting started in real estate, I moved down to Florida just because I hated the cold weather. And, um, and ultimately, you know, through through those challenges um, uh, of, of the crash and uh, leading into it, actually, I bought a couple of commercial properties, but then you really didn't get a chance to scale that up. But then ultimately, uh, going through the crash and looking at how to potentially rebuild the business, um, you know, post-crash timeframe, um, I really set my sights on initially multifamily, but ultimately um, I, I was introduced to mobile home parks. That's kind of where the world of mobile home parks really um, came to light. And uh, from 2011 till present time, um, we've bought mobile home parks in about 18 different states and um, at any, any point in time, typically owned anywhere between 15 to 20 parks. And then aside from that, we also own parking lots of parking garages and other commercial type of assets. So we've been pretty well versed in the commercial space, but our bread and butter, at least over the last decade or so has been, has been mobile home park. So, but I did get my start just like a lot of folks do in, in single family. I just, for me, it was a more of a, how do I build things back up quicker after the, the crash occurred? I, how do I get back to a scale faster and going and buying a hundred single family homes 
seemed really daunting to me. It just seemed like a l- little bit bigger of a mountain to climb than maybe going and buying, you know, 250 unit apartment complexes or, or something similar. So, Kevin, that's an outstanding story. Thank you for sharing that with us and walking us through it. I think so many of our audience is very interested in exactly what you've done, starting in the single family space. Mm-hmm. That's a very accessible place. Um, very predictable, stable place to invest in. But scalability is the name of the game here to really get to the level where, you know, you have some sort of financial independence and your your portfolio is growing exponentially. And you can scale that in single family. Um, But I think single family is a great place to start for many people and then looking at compounding that over time. Mm -hmm. Of course, to your point about scaling through single family, it's a challenge if you're just saving up the next down payment. Yeah. You know, and then at some point, capital is the most limiting factor for everyone. And so, of course, I, I'm sure that led into you know raising private capital from mm-hmm. uh, other sources to help you grow your business. But can you tell us just a little bit more? I mean, you alluded to the tr- the transition to kind of commercial initially, but what was it about? I mean, at, at the single family space, I, I guess the first question is, do you feel that that's a good place for people to get started that maybe have capital, they don't have a lot of experience or time, or maybe they have limited capital? And what does that look like on a transition into commercial? At what point should people be thinking about that or or things they do now to position themselves to do that? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, for me, uh, well, I answer, yeah, there's a couple of questions kind of loaded in there, uh, but you know, is is residential a good place to get started? I absolutely think it is. I mean, and I know, don't get me wrong. Like I, I know, I know, you know, guys today that still, are predominantly focused on running like their primary business is they, you know, they either fix or flip, you know, two or 300 homes a year, or they've got a rental portfolio of a few hundred single family properties, right? Like that's their primary, primary business. But a lot of times you'll, you'll see that they'll take their profits and they'll take and put that in, you know, uh, limited partner investments. in uh, most of the time, large multifamily properties or maybe self-storage properties or a litany of other different larger scale projects. Um, and that's kind of where they're, you know, kind of redeploying the capital and putting it into something that's going to be a little bit more of a longer term cash flow play. That's a little bit more of a passive nature for them. And so, but you know, single family is great to get started. I mean, you, you literally can't beat the financing uh, uh, options that are out there. Right. I mean, even, even, even like, you know, up to a duplex, right? Like it's still considered, uh, it still qualifies for a conventional mortgage. I mean, you literally cannot beat a 30 year amortization, um, uh, with no balloon on a, you know, literally on a, on a, on a residential loan for, for a fourplex. And so if you are looking to get started, you've got limited capital. I absolutely think it's a great place to start. In fact, I always tell people that, you know, even if you think that, even if you think that like, like your grandeur vision is I want to go buy a hundred unit apartment complexes or, you know, whatever side, larger side, larger scale apartment complexes. I always think it's best to risk your own capital first, right? And prove your prove the concept first with your own money before you go taking capital from friends, family, or work associates, what have you. There's a lot of capital flowing out there today. And, you know, people are looking for a place to put in. So you, more than likely, you could probably go pitch a compelling story and probably get money, even if you hadn't done another a, a deal yet. But I would suggest that maybe you take your own money, do a smaller project. Again, you know, speaking to like a four unit property. And, you know, if you're going to be a value add investor, if that's what you kind of see yourself as, go buy a value add fourplex, execute on the business plan and document every step of the way. And then when you go to actually raise money, it's going to make it a little easier as well, because you're going to say, hey, here's what I did here. Here's kind of what I here the basis I bought it at. You know, you know, spent twelve thousand dollars in each one of these units. I knew that I was going to be able to generate, you know, uh, uh, you know, three hundred dollars in additional market rents in each unit as the lease is turned after I did those renovations. And based on, you know, um, uh, new evaluation, I paid five hundred. I was all in for five hundred, and new appraisal came at eight hundred. Whatever, you know, I'm just throwing n- random numbers out there. That makes it a lot easier to raise capital, but it also proves that you know what you're doing. You're able to execute in a small scale, and you know, doing on a larger scale, you know, adds complexities, but ultimately that's what I suggest folks do. And you can do it with a conventional mortgage. So I'll get you know, circling back around and you could do it with a conventional mortgage that has the best terms of any loans out there. So, um, that's a beautiful way to, to position yourself in the future to be real successful is yeah, you got to have a proven track record. Um, that's obviously going to build confidence of anyone giving you money, but also scaling up to the commercial side as you go through those commercial loans, those banks also want to see a track record, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they're, they're not Absolutely. going to feel very confident in, um, I mean, most people are not jumping right into large multifamily or commercial type of assets. They're, they're building their track record and their path and their experience level. Um, but whether you're raising private capital to expand your portfolio or trying to go apply for a commercial type of investment property, 
they want to see a track record. They want to see a business plan that actually works. Um, and you don't always have to be a value add. I mean, just simply holding real estate for a few years looks really good. I mean, if it's if it's profitable, um, you don't always have to be flipping, but just showing that you're a successful investor is always a good way to position yourself moving forward. What What is the right time for someone to say, I mean, obviously this is an individual type of question for each person, but what is the right time to scale to uh, multifamily? If they're not looking to you know, potentially syndicate or you know, they actually want to own the physical asset, when should someone look from breaking out to that you know, one to four unit to something mid or large size multifamily? Yeah, I don't know if there's necessarily a right time. It's, I guess it's whenever you feel comfortable when the right opportunity presents itself. I'd say maybe, maybe start looking, you know, just if, if you know you want to go that route, you know, start looking at larger deals and underwriting larger deals and, and, and modeling them out and, and understanding the mechanics behind a larger deal versus a smaller deal. But I, I don't know if there's necessarily a, a time other, a, a best time other than like whenever you're comfortable and assuming that you have the confidence uh, to, you know, to bring in the appropriate capital, you've got the confidence on the from the team side, like you've got the right team in place to actually execute on a bigger deal. Because a lot of those bigger deals, I mean, if you're going to go buy a hundred unit apartment complex, most of the time you don't see those um, typically taken down by just one sole individual. And I know that it, that exists, but like that's not the norm. Normally, it's a couple partners, um, but also behind the scenes, there's probably some additional team members, right? They got a property management team, maybe not vertically integrated, but they've got a relationship with a local firm in the market that they're they've already interviewed probably a few uh local firms in the market that they're looking to buy in um they knew who can help them execute on that business plan because in these larger scale projects what happens a lot of times is you know, that you, the, the the general contractor component or the project management component while there there are aspects of it that are going to be in-house that you're responsible for like you're ultimately accountable for the entirety of it but you're going to be reliant upon probably the team that the project man or the property management company puts in place. They're, they're going to be essentially a conduit to the, uh, you know, to the general contractor and to the teams that are on site doing renovations or doing the work or improvements that are necessary. And so there's a lot of moving pieces and, and things that are happening there. And so I just, I would say, you know, educate yourself, surround yourself with others that are actually doing some bigger deals now and just understand what differences exist between a larger scale project and maybe those four unit properties that you were doing. And once you feel comfortable, take the leap, you know, there's no better time than today, but you got to make sure that you're comfortable in taking that leap. Yeah. So you mentioned just there, you know, finding the right team and, you know, we talk to people about vetting your property managers, doing this, doing that. What is the difference between, vetting a property manager for single families versus you know a multifamily commercial property i mean it's is there is there a difference first off yeah i think so i mean there's um there's a number of uh of uh of groups out there that all they specialize in are multifamily properties and and in fact um th they'll basically have kind of a floor of like we won't even really consider taking on a client that you know has anything smaller than that of a hundred unit property or hundred fifty unit property because they know there's economies of scale once you get to a certain size, and so you basically want to uh, you you want to interview property management companies that that have other clients that have projects that are similar to that of yours that actually have, again it's kind of the same with like being an investor having a track record well you definitely want to go with a property management company that has a track record of um, taking on projects or properties that are just like yours in that same marketplace. Um, again, same goes with single family properties, you know, find, find the property management companies that are managing, um, you know, you know, hundreds or maybe even thousands of single family properties. And the bigger is not necessarily better. You can find some small mom and pops that do a great job as well. But you know, in today's world, you, you definitely want to find a group that um, embraces and leverages technology. I mean, like there's, there's so many advances and so many advantages of, of the different software that's out there and technology that's out there to you know, market the property, to present it in its best light. I mean, gosh, nowadays, I mean, you shouldn't even have to have a physical leasing agent showing a property. Um, I mean, I, I, I met with one of the, um, one of the partners of uh, Progress Re Residential. They literally are the they are the largest property management company in the single family house space. I mean, they, they, they manage like 90,000 single family home properties, mostly for the institutional guys. And I met with them the other week, just we're doing some build the rent projects out in Phoenix. And um, we met with them, had, had a conversation, some of their best practices and some of the things they do. And I mean, they literally do not have leasing agents. They, they kind of have an in-house person, but there's it's, it's all literally 
touch of the you know, touch of the century as far as um, uh, you know, they get their license, they put it into the system, not touch up. They have a key, you know, keypad on the on the door. They plug it in. Um, you know, someone in the main corporate office knows when that individual's there. It knows when they when they leave. Ultimately, they do all the applications online. I mean, like it's all it's all seamless. There's not like a physical person. There's not inefficiencies associated with a leasing agent driving from spot to spot to spot. And um, you, you want to definitely be with a company that's leveraging and embracing those technologies and and ultimately because really it's gonna it's gonna be savings for you because every dollar that that property management company spends to manage your property, I can promise you is getting passed back to you and is getting taken away from your potential profits. So well, you know, leasing is one of those uh, one of those expenses that I mean, yeah. yeah, if it's not necessary and you can have you know just as effectiveness as being uh, having someone actually show the property and leasing it out, then fantastic. That's it. That's a huge expense. Yeah, um, no, absolutely. So, let's but as far as, you know, as far as the interview, I think the question was like, how do, is it different? It's not a different process. I mean, again, just, you know, get, get, um, get references, you know, talk to other investors that have a, you know, a portfolio of properties being managed by this group and, and, and talk to them, give them a call and find out what their experience has been. And, uh, um, very quickly, you'll be able to identify the ones to probably stay away from and, and the ones that, you know, uh, are, are probably more worth your while to spend time with. And if you have a network of legitimate brokers and, and people that are operating at a high level in the space, I mean, re yes. recommendations from them, I think are, are key, you know, just cause they're going to know who the key players are Absolutely. in the area. Um, switching gears a little bit, Kevin, because you, you operate in a space that we really haven't interviewed someone on, um, extensively. So this would be mobile home parks and also, uh, I think you said par like parking facilities and storage, That's right? Mm -hmm. so, well, yeah. So, so our, our company, our vertical uh, internally, we own mobile home parks, parking lots and parking garages, and then, you know, build to rent. Those are kind of like our, our three food groups that we do internally. I want to talk about all three, but I've, I've never actually had a conversation with someone that operates in the parking lot space. <laughs> Can we talk about what, like, what that, what that even means, what that looks like from an investment? Like, you know, just give yeah. us kind of high level on that. I mean, it really is. It, it's, it's, it's when you, when you really break it down, it's about as basic as basic gets at least a, a surface parking lot right and so it's what attracted us to that space and uh, you know is that it, it had a lot of similarities to, to the mobile home parks that we operate right in, in in most of our mobile home parks not all but most of them we don't own any of the homes any of the mobile homes and so we're basically renting the lot you know we're responsible for the infrastructure for the you know the common areas and then the water lines and sewer lines and the roads and, and things like that but as far as the homes themselves that are sitting on those lots, they pay us lot rent. And, uh, you know, if the roof goes, you know, starts leaking or their AC goes out, they're calling the, you know, the maintenance person themselves. They're not calling us to come fix it. And so we start looking at parking assets as a really a, a cash flowing covered land play. And, and, you know, the attractive nature was that, uh, it, again, a very sim similar to that of mobile home parks. When we started buying them like 10 years ago, 10 years ago, mobile home parks were incredibly fragmented. Um, mostly mom and pop owned uh, a few institutions in the space, but nothing like it is today. Uh, today, there are billions upon billions of, of private equity institutional dollars trying to pour into the space. Unfortunately, there's a limited supply of it. And so uh, there's a massive supply demand imbalance, which is good if you own parks today and if you're a seller, but it's made it a little more challenging to buy, you know, buy right, I guess you could say. Um, with the parking lot space, it's very fragmented. Lots of mom and pop owners. Um, you know, and if, I'll give you an example of a parking lot we bought in North Carolina, and, and it, it, it would kind of help you better understand the business model and the opportunity we see uh, in that space. Downtown Wilmington, North Carolina, historic district, phenomenal location. Um, uh, There's a surface parking lot that um, back in 2007 was owned by a local developer. He was going to go for, I think it had, I think it's got, uh, it's got 20 or 24, um, uh, uh, stories of, of air rights, uh, 2008 happened. That developer did not develop his property and it had been a, just a surface lot. It's a hard signalized intersection. It's small. It's only 20, it's 23 or 24 spaces. Um, so it's tiny, it's not big, but it's literally on the main strip where all the restaurants are, the historic waterfront. It's a prime location. And, um, a local doctor bought it in 2009, um, as an REO, you, you know, the bank took it back. He bought it for, I don't know, 300 some odd thousand dollars. And basically was running it until we bought it, you know, roughly a year and a half ago. And he had his, you know, his son was, you know, there on site taking payments from people. I mean, they didn't have a credit card machine. I mean, they were pretty antiquated in nature, but they were for him. It was a cat. Like he paid, he paid like 350 for it. 
And, you know, his uh, his NOI uh, the prior year to us buying it, I think, was thirty eight thousand. And so, like for him, it was a huge win. Like he's collecting cash. He's probably not reporting all of it like he's he's rolling in the dough. Right. Well, we looked at it and we went and, and interviewed. Um, we, we found out who the top three operators were in that marketplace, um, you know, parking management operators. There's local regional and national companies. There's a ton of them. I mean, there's hundreds of parking management companies throughout the US. Again, you know, some local, some more regional scale and, and some on an entirely national scale. Uh, but we found the three local that manage the most lots in this area and basically uh, put out a a um, a uh, proposal for bid. Uh, basically, hey, guys, like we're buying this property under contract. Give us your best offer on a trip on at least. I knew I went and count. We literally spent like two days there. We counted cars coming in and out. We knew the rates were low. We knew that they were missing cars because they weren't accepting credit cards. Literally, I don't carry cash. I wouldn't park there because I didn't have cash, right? And so they were literally missing like 40% of the potential revenue because they literally weren't taking credit cards. Um, just little simple mistakes like that, like just antiquated you know, mindset of a mom and pop operator. And um, one of these operators came back with us. They, they gave us, they basically gave us a triple net lease, um, a five-year triple net lease at $72,000 and with 3% escalators uh, over the next uh, five years. And we paid six ninety five for the lot, and so this doctor was he was winning, like he doubled his profits in the years he had it. Um, when he bought it, it was basically a ten cap, and we were able to see the upside value by handing it off to another operator. They knew there was upside above their triple at lease, right? But they ins instituted you know credit card payments. They have local enforcement, and you know for us it was a basically unlevered ten cap going into it, and we literally do nothing. It's a triple at lease. We don't handle anything. And it's a prime location and there's lots of lots out there that are just like that that you know have you ever parked in a parking lot where there's like those metal boxes where you shove your dollars into you guys ever see those things those things still exist in some markets <laughs> and i can promise you that if it's in a good location it could do way better if it was actually listed on like ways and, and, on, and you know on google um a google business directory and people knew that it existed uh you know, people that even weren't from that immediate area. And also if they took credit cards. Right. And so, um, another thing that they instituted that had never existed is dynamic pricing. And, you know, that's a big thing with these mom and pop run parking lots. You know, this guy, they only ever charged $3 an hour, $3 an hour, no matter what, how busy it was. Weekend, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And so, yeah. And so immediately this operator came in and they institute, like there's some weekends where, they do a lot of, I guess they do a lot of films in downtown Wilmington. I did not know that. Um, it's a prime location for, as a film set. And um, there's like $25 flat rates, you know? And um, anyway, just little things like that. But, uh, but ultimately it's just no, it's no different than any other value add, like just understanding where the upside potential lies. Um, and I'm going to give you guys some additional insight here. Cause this is where it's really powerful to understand. So that lot, again, we paid six ninety five. dollars um, They give us a $72,000 a year triple at lease. I became pretty good friends with the operator of this lot. I've, I've, he's a CEO. Uh, he's, they're a big outfit, but I've become really good friends with him. Friends enough to where I say, Dan, I said, I would love to know just for my own internal knowledge and you got a lease, so I can't do anything. Can you please show me what this thing did last year? Like, like I just, I want to know just what, what's possible of this little 23 space lot. In 2021, he gave me this is just a couple like a couple months ago we had this conversation. He gave me 2021's numbers. Um, this thing grossed $137,000, this little rinky dinky lot. And I can promise you their expenses just you look at the, the delta, it's pretty big. <laughs> their expenses weren't all that <laughs> they didn't spend 60 grand. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, with man, that just blows my mind. I, th I think yeah. Adam and I are going to start looking at uh, Monpa <laughs> parking spaces now. But I guess the interesting thing is. You so you're not actually hiring a management team to come in and operate the space for a person. Right. You're you're leasing it out. Yeah, because a business. That's right. Because ultimately, we don't. You know, they they manage like 13 other lots in the area. They've got they've got staff that enforces. You know, uh, you know, does enforcement. Um, they've got you know um, uh, um, subscription agreements with you know merchant company. You know, like credit card processing companies. And I mean, they got all those things in place already. And for us, if I can make the numbers work now, don't get me wrong. I mean, if, if you'd have told me this thing did one hundred and thirty seven thousand dollars, I'm sure we could have probably figured out a way just to throw a credit card machine <laughs> there and deal with it. Right. But again, that's not scalable. That's not your model. Really. Yeah, that's, that's not, not yeah. and that's not scalable. Right. Like doing one off little things like that. It's not a really a scalable model. And so 
Um, and I, and I want those guys to win too, right? Cause I want them to be my, I, I want them to come to, when I have another opportunity, I want them to be able to uh, be my liaison and like, give me some insider knowledge because they've been doing parking for 20 years. I haven't. Right. And, uh, they can see things that I can't see. They can see opportunities that I don't see. And so, Did so that's one example. Um, and there's, there's many more like that. So the whole objective of finding a good parking lot <laughs> either in a, like a downtown CBD or a, a tours, a, you know, tourist location is to find it before it has, before the market so, uh, so uh, thriving so much that it has a, now it has a higher and better use to be redeveloped. So to where a developer would see a higher value in buying it to build something than that of what it can produce as far as cash flow. So like today that, that we only bought a year and a half ago, we would not have been able to buy that today because downtown Wilmington now it's cranes everywhere. Like it kind of, we, we bought it at a weird time during COVID and things were halted. And um, anyway, just no one knew what was going to happen in it. Pre COVID it wasn't, it was growing down there, but like they're, they had a bunch of projects about to come out of the ground, but they had not come out yet. Now in the post COVID world, we see that that area is thriving and we, a developer would have been the buyer of that. Um, and so you get to it before it's got that higher and better use component, but where it still makes sense as a cash flowing parking lot. So could you take that and sell it? I mean, I don't, I don't know how fa financing yeah. works on um, parking spaces, but I mean, could you sell that to just an end buyer that's going to pay what a six cap or whatever yeah, the case an annuity. is. Yeah. I mean, we actually, yeah. we, we bought it cash. And so we're actually putting debt on it right now. We had not put debt on it. Um, like I said, it did, it meets all of our, you know, all of our target metrics as far the, it's in a fund with a bunch of other properties, but even unlevered, it, 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 it meets all the target metrics. So we were never in a rush to put debt on it, but we're actually putting some debt on it um, through a, a, just a local bank. It's a smaller deal, but they, um they valued it at, I think it was, I think it was 1. 1. 1.35 or 1. 1.4, something like that, just from a cash flow perspective. And um, they're willing to give us a 70% loan on it. And you know, just and it's really based on the the power of the, or the you know, the uh, the lease itself, the underlying lease that's on the property. And so that lease is guaranteed by by this UPP Global. I mean, it's a, again, yeah. they're a, yeah, they're a, a, a firm that's got I don't know the they've got, you know, four or 500 parking assets that they manage, uh, from Maine all the way down to Florida. So did you get it, their evaluation be prior to closing on it? Did you put it under contract, get the, get the valuation on performance and then close, or did you know, you know, buying it cash, you pretty conf high confidence that you were going to be able to do something with it? Um, I didn't have a, uh, you know, so we tied it up and then we spent a couple of days there kind of counting cars and I had enough confidence that, it was going to, I, I thought it was going to probably, you know, grow somewhere between like 70 and 90,000, like just from my very back of the napkin <laughs> evaluation. It's again, literally just counting cars on a, on a Friday and Saturday. I tried to get like one weekday and one weekend day and, um, and ran some just really uh, basic math on it. But I, I had no idea that it could do is what it had done. So anyway, I was pretty confident that, um, that we would make the deal work one way or another. Um, I didn't realize there was that much of a Delta there, but, uh, anyway, I, I was very <laughs> confident it. going into it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so anyway, but I, again, I want them to win too. And I wouldn't have known if he wasn't my friend, most companies wouldn't have given that information away, but, uh, um, it was good to know. It was good to know. How do you, how do you find those deals? I mean, I, you don't really see parking lots with the for sale sign yeah. on them. Uh, yeah, so least... It wasn't for sale. It actually yeah. wasn't for sale. Uh, so we did, uh, how do you find direct, it? that one was, a, that one was a direct mail. So that was a direct mail. Um, a lot of the other lots that we've purchased uh, have been, um, I'd say the, the majority of the others have been just getting, building a relationship with the, again, like I said, there's a ton of parking management companies. And here's the interesting thing that, that blew me away when we started um, looking into this niche was the hundreds of parking management companies that exist throughout the US, the majority of them, there are a few, but the majority of them do not own real estate. They do not own the real estate. They are strictly a, a fee management company which blew my mind, absolutely blew my mind. Even this group that we're using here, I met them at a conference and I got talking with them and that's how, kind of how we you know, grew a little bit of a bond and they just happened to be one of the operators in this market. And anyway, I was like, why don't you, like, I get it that you guys have a, it's a cash flow business, right? It's asset light. And so it's, you know, it's, he bootstrapped it. He started this thing nine, 10 years ago. Now they do like, I don't know, um, $9 million top line revenue. I mean, like it's a, they're, they've grown up pretty substantially, but I'm like, 
but you don't own anything after it's all said and done. I mean, slowly these things get redeveloped and I get there's, there's not a lot of new parking coming online, but like it's every day is a battle. How about, but you buy some of this stuff. And so, yeah. and so anyway, you know, one of the ways that we find lots now is we just build relationships with guys like him or other, we don't really tell them all the secrets of why they should be buying it. Now we, we just say, Hey, if you guys know of a lot that's for sale or could be for sale, cause they're always canvassing these areas that they're managing and they have competition with other operators. And so, if they know of something that's maybe being mismanaged by another operator, I'll say, hey, give me some insights. I'll go look it up. I'll contact the owner. But like you, you key me in on a lot that's a phenomenal location. Maybe it's one you would like to manage. And you tell me that information and I'll give you first crack at, you know, the proposal if we end up buying it. And so this, you know, yeah. indirect um, relationships, uh, you know, with parking lot. Operators. So, so. What, what was his answer though, as far as uh, why, why, why not hold the assets? I mean, and, I can't yeah, see yeah, this. Then. A, lot, a lot of them just don't know that bit. Now, there's, again, like I said, there are a few. Like, there's one group called Laz, and they're a huge. They're, they're the largest private company um, in our space, and so they're huge. Um, but they they have they do third party management. They manage their own as well, and then they have a big real estate division. But a lot of them, and you know, a lot of them just they don't know that side of the business. That they they wouldn't know how to go raise. 20 million dollars if they had to to you know buy an asset and so it's very different for them again having an asset light model you don't have to have 20 million dollars to start a local parking you know company i mean again like i said a lot of them bootstrap it you know they get a couple lots underneath management and they got some cash flow coming in all, all they have to be able to do is hire staffing to actually manage these properties it's and, very different than buying an actual physical asset that that's really the only answer i have for you <laughs> that's no and that, i mean that makes sense i mean we see yeah. it a lot too but, um in the you know as we spoke on on your show about com um commercial retail i mean a lot of those businesses too it's like owner operator medical space it's like it never made sense to me why why they would not just own the space but as they're expanding their business they want to keep their capital in that's the it. business and working for them not tying it up yeah, uh, in the asset, and they and they're not doing the value add type of scenario. Yeah, I mean the way to do it would be you'd have to have two separate divisions of the company. Like it'd have to be two standalone companies. And uh, I just again, a lot of them just kind of fall into the trap of of the management side, and it becomes a cash flowing business. And and they do fine with it, and they probably take that cash flow and deploy it into other investments, hopefully. And uh, but a lot of them they don't own the uh, the, the parking assets, which always baffled me. <laughs> well, the same the same question could apply. I mean, we have some discussions with some of our investors too is like you know why why are renters ever renting a house you know yeah. if, if they have such good financials and they're earning six figure income why would they why would they why wouldn't they just buy it you know and there's good there's some people are just renters for life or whatever the situation mm -hmm. is so yeah it's anyways it's like if uh if you ever want to find a group of people who don't invest in real estate talk to real estate agents <laughs> um, yeah pretty much everyone i've talked to none of them actually own rental property they'll sell properties but yeah. they uh they don't buy them. And, and flippers too. And in the turnkey space, it baffles me how many people make money in real estate and don't put it back into holding real estate, which is real where yeah. your real wealth is created long-term. But we, I think we all digress here. No, um, yeah, even the commercial brokers. I mean, so it's all the way around. I mean, like a, a, a very small percentage, you know, they see what the money is that their clients are making and they're like, well, I need to be on both sides of the table. But <laughs> most of the others like just want that commission check and they're okay with that. So it doesn't make sense to me. Tell us a little bit about mobile homes too. I mean, we, we don't have to go through a specific example, but one thing that you, that blew my mind, Kevin, when I was on your show a couple months ago or whenever, but there was uh, we were talking about cost segregation studies, and uh, I was kind of going through my recent uh, cost segs that I had done, and um, you had mentioned that some of your mobile homes are like eighty percent plus, um, you know, of the bonus depreciation that you're able to take, and that just, yeah. that just blew my mind. First of all, since there's you don't own the houses. I was like, well, what are you most depreciating? Of, yeah, because you're buying the land with the infrastructure. That's it. Like you're not buying the house, and so the value is in the land and the income that the land generates. But you know the infrastructure, the roads, the you know, electric pedestals, the sewer lines, water lines, things. So that, that's you know, all pulled into that depreciation. That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I I think the high. I I I can't recall. I think I think we maybe have had one go over eighty percent, but I think most of them fall in the realm of like high sixties to you know, high seventies in that range, but still it's really high. 
it's by far the most tax efficient of all, you know, the only other um, asset, and this is just recently, um, I just invested in some car washes, like the express car washes. Man, you do it all, I guess, huh? Yeah. And I mean, so these are like, Pat, these are like, you know, you know, per personal, you know, limb, uh, you know, passive investments, living partner investments with other syndication groups. And uh, that, that I know, I just, I've gotten to know a lot of people in different niches. Like you can't be an expert at everything, but there's niches that I like. Like I love self-storage. I love medical office. I love multifamily, but like we can't be that to every week. We can't, you know, go venture in all those niches and chase those shiny objects. Otherwise we won't get anything done. And so, but I, I love them enough to where I'll find the, the sponsors and syndicators that, that are experts in those spaces and those verticals and put money with them. Um, but uh, yeah, car washes are pretty tax efficient as well. They're pretty tax efficient as well. So on the mobile home parks, are you doing triple nets on those two or are you managing them yourselves or what are you doing no. there? Yeah, unfortunately, now that's, you know, it's, I guess it's one of the, um, I don't know if I call it a downside, but there, you know, you can look at it as a pro or a con, but um, you know, unfortunately, there's not really any, it's unlike the multifamily space where if you go to any major or secondary market, you can find a property management company. You'll find a number of them to, to, to kind of choose from. Mobile home park space, not so much. There's a couple management companies, one that's national. You know, we kind of went down that road a few years back and had hor horrific experiences. And ultimately, you know, we always had been vertically integrated and we tried to hand it off a couple years back and it was disastrous. And then just realized that like, in order to be in the space, like you have to have your own property management division. And so we have an internal, it's the unsexy part of the business. You know, <laughs> it's, it's just not fun, right? Like it's, it's, it's operationally intensive, um, but it is what it is. It's a necessary evil. And so that, you know, I, I, I say it's a, it's a, it's a con because of that. Like we just have another division or company that it turns a little bit of a profit, but it's, I would never own that by itself. Like it's not worthy of owning it by itself. It's not profitable enough to deal with the headache associated with it, but we have to, because we own the assets. But, and so the pro behind that would be that, those that are getting into the space that um, that that like to own more than just a few mobile home parks, they very quickly realize that you know they own the first one and they're kind of spending their time on. They're kind of be they're the main guy. Maybe they got an on-site manager, um, but they're kind of they can't afford a bookkeeper yet, so they're doing the bookkeeping and do a little bit of everything. It's not really passive. Uh, and then they buy a second one. They just two x you know their time in their business, but they probably still can't afford an employee at that point in time. And so they, they hit like kind of a wall at a certain point of like, well, damn, I need actually more than just one employee. I can't just hire one person to be the entire property management company. And so they have to make a decision. Do I want to build out a property management company and probably go on the red for a period of time. And then, but also I'd be forced to actually buy a number of more assets to get to the point where I'm in the black uh, with the property management division. So it's a weird pivotal moment that you run into and that scares a lot of people away they just don't they don't want to do that like they don't want to be running you know a, you know a, a, or staffing a company um just to own these investments and so again it's a pro and con i give you look at it either way but you have to be vertically integrated in order to be in this business yeah with with a mobile home park i mean what's what's the big value add with that because i've also heard some extraordinary stories of people buying under performing parks and just like blowing it out of the park now it's a lot of work and you know mm -hmm. takes as, as you mentioned is a much more competitive type of situation but what are some key things you can do to value add i mean what does it even yeah. really like look like from an investment standpoint owning sure. a mobile home park yeah and it, it's very similar to that of you know the different value add leverage you can pull in like a multi-family property so you know we always kind of look at it like the high hanging fruit the middle hanging fruit and then the low hanging fruit and so low hanging fruit would be something as simple as a rent increase like that's a low-hanging fruit like you know, we're buying it today owner has owned it for 30 years hasn't raised rents in 10 years right so lot rents are 250 they should be 400 dollars, right like that that's that's a really low-hanging fruit because all that really takes is a piece of paper and a notice to the residents that the rent's going to be increased by x number of dollars on the state so that's that's really easy low-hanging fruit um Kind of the middle hanging fruit would be, um, you know, back when a lot of these parks were built, you know, 40, 50, even 60 years ago, water, water and sewer expenses just weren't anything anyone really cared. Like they weren't expensive. Like they, they, they didn't make up a percentage of your, of your monthly expenses. It was such a minute number that most parks were built with just a master meter at the front of the park. And it just, that was included in your rent. You got water and sewer. So they didn't have individual meters at each location. And so, over time, water and sewer has gone up significantly, but also over time, these parks, the infrastructure ages. And so you've got you know, water lines that 
you know, have breaks more often, you know, than what they did when they were newer. And um, so you, you're losing water and you know, your costs, your, your costs are significantly rising. Uh, and then you also have people that just irresponsible. You got residents that are irresponsible with their water, right? You've got the, the household that takes eight showers a day, washes 10 cars a day, has their friends over to wash their cars. And anyway, I see a lot of parks where we'll go in and their line item for water and sewer expenses is, you know, high six figure. I mean, it's, you know, $150,000, $200,000 a year that they're eating, that the park's actually paying for. And, uh, and so that's middle hanging fruit because we can build that back. But in order to do that, we've got to put some equipment in. So we'll go install individual submeters at each one of the respective lots. Each one of those submeters, you know, with insulation and the you know, cost of equipment is four to $500 um, a pop. And so, but the payback period is fairly significant uh, or it's, it's fairly quick. And also that most of the time, if you're, if, if your infrastructure is in half decent shape, most of the time you can recapture roughly 85. And if you're doing really, really good, you'll recapture about 90% of that water and sewer expense. And so basically almost all that, what was above the line goes now to your bottom line. And so, you know, you put a cap rate on saving a hundred thousand dollars a year. I mean, you guys can do the math. I mean, it's a very significant value increase and uh, and a very quick payback on the cost of that equipment to install. And so that that would be like middle hanging fruit. Also, middle hanging fruit would be operational, you know, inefficiencies, fixing those, just you know, managing collections better. You know, ha having a you know, pay or no stay policy in place, getting rid of any you know hangover delinquencies that are there, or just retraining the residents to essentially pay on time or this is not the place for you. We see it all the time with mom and pops. They become friends with the residents and they just let things slide um, more often than not. And so that, that's a big one. And then high hanging fruit, uh, high hanging fruit would be bringing in, you know, homes on the vacant lots. And so a lot of, a lot of the parks that we come across, uh, just to give you an example, uh, we just bought a park up in um, Illinois, two parks. It's about 364 lots in total between these two parks. But one of them, uh, one of them has 52 vacant lots. All the lots were fully developed when they built this park. So the infrastructure is there, um, not hundred percent of the infrastructure, but like the water, the sewer line, the gas line, all that's there. We do have to put do a little bit of lot prep uh, in order to put a put a home on there. But ultimately, it's there. It's zoned for it. We can bring in fifty two homes. Um, you know, it's high hanging fruit because it's capital intensive. It takes time. There's obviously risk associated with it because we've got to have a big outlay of cash, and we've got you know it's going to be sitting out there until we can resell these units, which could be you know, six, eight months after we actually outlaid the cash. And so, um, but it's still, it adds a ton of value to the community. Uh, it, it greatly improves the aesthetics of the community because you're bringing brand new homes in and just you know, really you know, bringing things up to a modern, uh, a modern state state. And, um, but it's, it, it's a very expensive to do. And so, and, and today with the, with the, the, you know, the shortage, the massive shortage that we're seeing on many different types of goods, what used to take us like three months to buy a new mobile home, meaning like, Hey, we're put an order in and the factory is going to spit out a mobile home. We'll have it on our lot in three months. Now it's like 12 to 15 months. And so much more challenging to actually get homes in the communities uh, due to the, you know, the, I guess, post COVID challenges that we're facing here. <laughs> so that it's just, there's many different ways, but like, those are like kind of the, the, the big ones uh, if I wanted to categorize them. Yeah. So whenever we're looking at single family homes, we're doing a lot in the South Southeast. We're doing some in the, you know, the Midwest. Are these the same markets that are good for um, mobile home parks or are there, you know, a little bit more landlord friendly laws that are in areas that you would not want to own single families because then your tenant can stick around for eight, nine, 10 months without paying rent. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it's really just that, I mean, you'd be looking in the same areas and kind of having the, the same mindset of, you know, I want to own it in landlord friendly States. Um, the same applies to, to, to mobile home parks. We've owned some stuff. Um, we own some communities up in New York. We no longer do. Um, and it gorgeous communities, um, but just we're an absolute nightmare just from a regulatory standpoint of doing business in that state all the way down to, you know, very, very unfriendly to landlords when it came to folks not not paying their rent. Um, so just life is too short, much easier to make money to, you know, in, in, in dealing with a landlord friendly states where people actually want to pay their rent. And so you know, kind of the same thing applies. But as far as, you know, like our business is affordable housing, right? And so we basically want to go to markets where there's an affordable, we want to buy parks and markets where there's an affordable housing crunch, which 
believe it or not, that's not that's not entirely across the entire United States. There's actually still plenty of markets that are fairly affordable, especially like some of the you know smaller you know Midwestern markets, and not not like a you know major city, but some like the secondary and tertiary market. It's, it's still they didn't see the impacts that a lot of us saw with like price increases after co or during COVID or after COVID. Um, I give an example, like we just looked at a park in Ohio today, some small town in Ohio, and and um, you know the median home price there is still like $109,000, which blew my mind uh, because that means probably prior to COVID, it was like probably under $100,000 and you can still rent a three bedroom home for $700 a month. That's affordable. And so owning a mobile home park there, I, I probably wouldn't take the risk. It might work, but more than likely um, you're going to be competing against an apartment or a home that someone could rent. And so why would they rent a mobile home if they could rent a stick built home? So just um, kind of as we wrap up here, Kevin, the, the last asset class is build to rent. Now that's a space that um, we operate quite heavily in and are, are fond of. But I mean, if you just a few bullet points, benefits of build to rent, why you like it, you know, if you go through that just quickly. Yeah, no, absolutely. So the projects that we're, that we're building are in Phoenix and Phoenix Metro. And um, these are urban infill type projects. And so the, unique in that we're not building on the outskirts. We're not getting big plots and lay on the outskirts of town and building, you know, 100, 200 unit uh, detached subdivisions. We're building, you know, very high end um, urban infill townhome, uh, townhome developments. And so first and foremost, at least as it pertains to these particular projects, they're main and main locations. I mean, they're irreplaceable locations. They're they're walkable to all the you know the restaurants and the you know the hip spots, and so they're in areas where there is no additional excess land to build. And so I like that because I, I it provides a good bit of insulation. I feel from the risk associated with when that day comes. I don't know. I think we're still years away from, it, but when that day comes, when we have an oversupply, right? And it will, it just, it might take five or six years or maybe even longer than that. But when that day comes, typically the areas that get hit the hardest are those areas that are on the outskirts, you know, where the push is continuing to happen. Um, those typically get affected before those that are in the, you know, in the, in the prime core area do. And so again, uh, that's one of the reasons we're excited with those. And number two is, you know, in the market, again, speaking to Phoenix, that, you know, Phoenix is just a thriving market, very diverse local business economy. And so like that, just tons of jobs flooding into that marketplace. Um, um, it, it's incredibly challenging at this point in time. If you wanted to go buy a newer built multifamily property, you'd probably be paying a, a sub four cap for it and po possibly even closer to a three cap for it. If, if you're in a, that type of desirable neighborhood and it doesn't really exist, all the, all they really exist in these little urban infills are these, um, these infill type projects. And so our basis, even with the, the you know, the cost and the labor being higher nowadays, our, you know, our basis going in is about 150 basis points higher than that of what we'd be buying the existing project for. So it's worth taking the development risk on something like this because our basis uh, is in a much better position than that of if we bought an existing product. In addition to that, we get to build them how we want. And so we get to actually not use inferior, you know, uh, inferior products or inferior materials where you see a lot of things that go up nowadays. I mean, they are literally using the cheapest stuff to build, like absolute builder grade stuff that you and I have seen all these apartment complexes going up with the wood and then just a little bit of stucco slap, slap on the side. I promise you that stuff is not going to look all that great in seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years. And so we're trying to build something that's durable, that's long lasting, that ultimately will stand the test of time um, as we serve that, that higher end clientele. And so I like it because our basis is higher. And then we're, again, we're in a main and main location, which is irreplaceable. It's absolutely irreplaceable. So just some of the aspects of why I like the projects that we're working on there in Phoenix and Phoenix is literally, it has been the number one growing market in the country for like the last, I don't know, five, six, seven, it's a long time. This entire run up, it's been one of the fastest growing markets in the country. Yep. Absolutely. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. We we're also operating like Zach said, heavily in the build to rent and it's a, uh, it's, I love it. <laughs> it's what I'm buying right yeah. now. Uh, you know, the, the rehab stuff I still like, I've got that in my portfolio. It does well, but I feel like market over the past, you know, four or five years has really shifted a lot towards build to rent, something yes. that wasn't there whenever I started investing, but it's uh, continuing to grow. Are you seeing uh, with your build to rents, are you building to hold or are you building yes. to sell? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I should have, you know, should have clarified there, but yes, we are building to hold. So everything that we're, we're building, it's a, it's a, at least a 10 year hold. That's kind of how we're modeling it out. And again, 
things change, there could be a chance that we sell one of the developments. But ultimately, we're, again, we're building it with the mindset that we're not just looking to build it, lease up, and then flip it. And so we're using a little bit higher end materials, things that are going to be a little more durable in the long run than that of if it was just going to be something that we we're just going to turn right after lease up stage. Yeah. No, not just yeah. waiting for that hedge fund to come around and yeah, that's it. And, I, and, and, that's, and I'm not going to you know hit anyone and for that. That that's a deep, that's a model where you can make money, right? And there's plenty of buyers out there to take that you know maybe a little bit more of an inferior product off the shelf quickly. But um, you know, I think the other thing building the build, uh, driving the build the rent space is now we got rates going up, right? Like I just heard something. I don't know the other day that you know loan app loan applications are down like forty percent right now. I mean, it's, there's just been a massive shift of those that could afford a house that you know would still like to own a house. There's been a shortage; they haven't been able to buy, and now rates are so high that they literally and prices haven't come down, and so they literally got priced out. I mean, they're they're gone now. They're not even they're not even a prospective home buyer anymore. They have to be a renter, and uh, unless rates you know come back down to the you know pre COVID levels, which I don't see them getting there, but uh, um, we're going to have, I mean, we really are pushing more towards that nation of renters faster than ever before. And so, which is again, perfect for the built to rent space. Yep, absolutely. Well, everybody, you can check him out at kevinbupp.com. That's Kevin, B-U-P-P.com. He also has a free book that he is uh, giving out to listeners here. And that is at kevinbupp.com slash free book. That should be pretty easy for you to remember if you want a free book. So kevinbutt.com slash free book. Kevin, anything else you want to leave our listeners with today? I don't think so, guys. It's been a pleasure being here. I appreciate everything you guys do and just uh, yeah, grateful that you had me on. Absolutely. Well, pleasure to have you. To everybody else, uh, check us out at renttoretirement.com. That's renttoretirement.com. Uh, you can find everything we do there from podcasts to YouTube to inventory we have, anything and everything. Schedule a call with us. You can uh, leave us a review on your podcast platform. We'd greatly appreciate it. You can also check out Kevin's podcast and uh, leave him a review there. Would really, he, I'm sure he'd appreciate that as well. So uh, you can find out everything about us at renttoretirement.com and we'll see you on the next episode. Thanks for watching the Rent to Retirement YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos like this one or this one here.